topic that I'm to speak on is it is all about souls. And when Wade called me and asked me to give him a title for a class, I thought, look, you know, uh, I always looked on the International Soul Winning Workshop as a focus. It's very easy for me to get out of focus. And the more I know you, the more I believe you're like me. And you get out of focus. And we get our minds and our hearts and our efforts and our money and everything all involved in things that are really not important. And I remember those marvelous words of the Apostle Paul in Philippians chapter 1 when he said about the people, it said, some of these preachers don't have the right attitude, boy. Some of them got the wrong motives. And, and Paul smiled. You know he smiled. If you, can't, if you can see through a ladder, you know that Paul smiled when he said, but what does it matter? The important thing is that Christ is preached. And I rejoice because of that, and I'm going to keep on rejoicing. So I, I thought right away, that's what I want to speak on. I want to rivet our attention. I want to call us back to what we all know is the truth. I'm not going to say anything that you do not believe or know is in the Bible, but I'm simply going to, by stirring up your pure minds by way of remembrance, remind you that it is all. And you spell that all with 17 L's. It is all about souls. And what a marvelous text. I'd like to read you from Luke chapter 19. Would you get your Bibles? It's page 927 if you have the right Bible. Luke chapter 19 begins uh, talking about Zacchaeus. One guy said, I'm going to preach on Zacchaeus. He was up a tree. Luke 19 and verse 10 reads, Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. And a man there by the name of Zacchaeus was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. And he wanted to see who Jesus was. But being a short man, he could not because of the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbs up in a sycamore tree to see him since Jesus was coming by that way. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and they began to mur mutter, He's gone to be the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now, I give half of my possessions to the poor, and if I've cheated anybody out of anything, I'm going to pay him back four times the amount. And Jesus said to him today, Salvation has come to your house, because this man too is the son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which was lost. Do you know why Jesus came? We used to sing a song years ago, and I guess some congregations still sing it. It's a marvelous song. Why did my Savior come to earth? And to the humble go, why did he choose a lowly birth? Because he loved me so. And that's true. That's scriptural. But it wasn't just because he loved us or he came to love us. He came to save us from our sins. I want you to realize that, that there were social problems in the world in which Jesus came, but those social problems did not bring Jesus. Before Jesus came, there was war, <clears throat> war and disease and oppression. But these things did not bring Jesus to the earth. The thing that tore the Son of God out of heaven and nailed Him to the cross was that we were sinners doomed and damned for a devil's hell eternity, and Jesus couldn't stand it because He loved us so. And so it was souls. It's all about souls. It was souls that took Jesus out of heaven and brought Him to the earth. For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And His love for the lost shows up in everything that He did. There's a marvelous little chapter. Some of you preachers come to town hunting sermon outlines. Preach one from Luke 14, beginning in verse 12, on the church that God blesses. I mean, it's all right there in the text. The church that God blesses. God does not bless everything. He does not bless every church. He does not bless every project. So the lesson starts off Luke 14 and verse 12 by saying, When you prepare a feast, and Jesus didn't care anything about your catering, some kind of social banquet. He's talking about a church. He's talking about church planting and church growing and church success and says... 
When you prepare a feast, don't invite your rich friends and neighbors because they'll get into the habit of inviting you back. It will be their turn again. But he said, if you really want to be blessed, you invite to your feast, you invite to your church, you make strong activity to bring in the, the poor and the lame and the halt and the blind. Now watch this. And you, you will be blessed. I want you to see the substantive, direct, strong language of the Son of God when He said, <clears throat> you do these things and you will be blessed. And churches where I travel all over America and all over the world, the ones that are making it, the ones that are really growing, are the ones that are reaching out to the poor and the lame and the halt and the blind, and they are being blessed of God. It is all about souls. My favorite chapter, and, and, and being here as long as I have been, in, in this workshop, Luke 15 is it. I mean, it is the gospel in a nutshell. If you don't have time to read the whole Bible, make sure you read Luke 15. Because here's Jesus getting ready to preach like I'm getting ready to preach and looking out over the audience. And the scribes and the Pharisees and the publicans and sinners were there just like this audience, by the way. And uh, Jesus looked around at them because they were saying, if this preacher really was somebody great, he wouldn't let them in here with us. And Jesus could read their thoughts. You better be glad the speakers today cannot read your thoughts. But Jesus could read their thoughts and said to them in answer to all these questions, He's wondering, how can I make people quit looking down their noses at other people? How can I make them realize we're all lost, we all need saving, and we've got someone to save us? And to answer those questions, Jesus told four stories. He said to those people who were basically shepherds, What man among you? Having a hundred sheep, if he loses one, does not. Leave the 99 in the fold and go out and search for the one that was lost until he finds it. And then he said, you know, looking around at them, then there were women there. The women may not get the point. And so he says, and a woman, what woman that has the ten coins? If she loses one, will not light a candle and sweep the house and search for that one lost coin until she finds it. And when she finds it, calls in the neighbors in the great celebration. And lest he miss the shepherds and the women, then he talks about families. And he said, now a father. Oh, father had two sons. And one of them said, Father, give me, give me, give me, give me, give me, give me. The more he got what he wanted, the less he wanted what he got. Give me all that belongs to me. Give me what I deserve. And it's a good thing he didn't get it. But the father gave him his part of the inheritance. And the boy goes out into a far country. Now, mind you, Jesus is answering the question, what kind of man is this? What kind of God do we have? And we've all played the part of the prodigal son or the prodigal daughter. And the boy went off into a far country and wasted his, in his state with wild living. And finally he realizes he, he ends up in the pig pen and he is in a ruin like everybody in this audience and in the world is in ruin when you turn your back on God. And the boy woke up. Good thing about Rip Van Winkle, he slept 20 years, but he woke up. Some people never do. But when he woke, what do you do when you wake up? What do you do when you see things as they really are? What do you do when you come to your senses? Well, the Bible says in Luke 15 and verse 17, when he came to his senses, he said, At home in my father's house, the servants do better than me. I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to arise and go home. That's what we're asking people to do. Come home. God is home. Church is home. The family of God is home. It's reunion. And when people really see it, and we preachers struggle to make them see it, and our inability to make them see it is why so many people do not come home. And then sometimes we act in such godless ways. We act in such divisive ways. We get off on things that show an emphasis on issues and things rather than people. And when we do it, the world doesn't see the reunion and see a God who says, please come home. Every day, please come home. And one day, when the boy decides, I'm going home to my father. And the Bible says in verse 20, the most beautiful verse in the Bible, you may want to take off your shoes, for verse 20 is holy ground. And when he was a long way off, the father saw him and had compassion and ran to his son. This is God and you and me. It's all about souls. And fell on his neck and kissed him. 
And the boy is saying, God, Father, I don't deserve this. And we do not deserve God's grace. We don't get it because we're so good. We get God's grace because He is so good. And the father is saying with his arms around that boy, whom God did not ask to sin. God did not shove him away, and God doesn't shove you away. You've done it because of the sin in your own heart and being separated from God. When we finally wake up and come home to God, that's what God is all about. So he says to the servants, bring the robe, best robe. Bring a ring and put it on his hand. Bring shoes for his feet. Kill the fatted calf because my boy was dead and is alive again. My boy was lost and he's found. And they begin to celebrate. I mean, church is celebration of winning lost souls. Maybe one reason there isn't much celebration going on in some churches is not many souls let one to Christ here. It's kind of like that old lady, that little, little lady that was visiting Westminster Abbey. It's probably one of the most uh, prestigious religious structures in the world. And the guide was so proud, as they always are, to show you Westminster Abbey. And the marble came from Africa, and this uh, carpet came, and the paintings came from here and there. And the heads of state sat there and there and there for the coronation of king so-and-so and queen so-and-so. And he was so impressed with his little spiel. And the lady said, yes, but has there been any souls saved here lately? I there's the rub. Churches, there's the rub. It's all about souls. It isn't, man, look at this parking lot we've got. Look at this building. Look at this, look at this ministry. Look at the things that we're doing. It's all, it always was all about souls. I love it in Matthew 22, the first 10 verses where God puts the same thing, Luke 14, into Matthew 22. And he says, go out and find as many as you can find, both bad and good. Did it really say bad and good? Because I was trying to get Dr. Money bags in the church because then we could make our budget. And Jesus said, you don't worry about money bags. You go out and, would you hear this again? Would you go out and find the poor and the lame and the halt and the blind? I listened to Kevin Oder. That's some name for a preacher, isn't it? You know, and uh, somebody said he was a real sinker. But I don't know about that. But anyway, Kevin felt heavily led to plant a church in Las Vegas. And he said, that's no place to bring up my children. I don't want to go to Las Vegas, but he felt the tug of God to establish a church in Las Vegas. And one Sunday, because they were trying to dress and all of their methods in preaching the gospel was to be so that the people there wouldn't think they were trying to be better than them or different from them. They wanted to dress like as much as they could so they could reach the people. And a little lady in hot pants and a hot bare midriff and a halter top came with a wad of money in her hand and the people noticed her and they and he taught his congregation to you know to get with them and say come sit with me and just make them feel right at home and this lady said he's crying and she said i need god i need to i need to talk to the preacher i need to get my daughter back and when he talked to her kevin talked to her he finally realized she was a high high priced prostitute in las vegas and the $800 that she held in her hand that she put in the contribution plate that morning was for her next cocaine fix. And she said, my mother's a Christian, a little Christian church in Missouri. And she said, my, she said, honey, you can't have your daughter back because you're not a fit mother. And I know she's right, but I want my daughter back. Let me make that story, long story short. They studied the Scriptures with that girl, baptized her into Christ. She married one of the single preachers on the staff and is now on staff in Las Vegas herself, doing a work among prostitutes in Las Vegas. Now, it's all about souls. That's why Jesus said, go out and find them. You don't find the people that will raise the prominence of your church in the community. You find people that are lost. You find... It's one beggar telling another beggar where there's bread, and that's what Jesus was all about. Uh, the fact that He can save us is, is remarkable. The fact that Jesus wants to save us is phenomenal. Well, the early church caught the soul's fire. That's what they were all about. That's what they were sent out to do. In Acts chapter 1 and verse 4, Jesus said after His resurrection, Now you go to Jerusalem, and you tarry there, you wait there, until you receive the promise that will come from on high. You're going to be, verse 8, you're going to be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the whole uttermost parts of the earth. And they went there. And the Holy Spirit came down, and the power of God came down, and filled those apostles, and thousands of people were there. And Peter stood up on that occasion and said, You men of Israel, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth, it was the hottest topic on their agenda. 
They had nailed him to the cross. They believed he was a fake. And now the tomb was empty and everybody was wondering, could he really have been? And Peter's sermon convinced them the man you nailed to the cross was God's son. He was your Savior. He was the Messiah. And the Bible says they were cut to the heart. And they asked Peter the question, what can we do? Expecting Peter to say, there's nothing you can do. You kill God's son and he's going to get you. But Peter with a smile, you know he smiled. When he said, if you guys would just repent, listen to this, and be baptized. I mean every one of you. In the name of Jesus Christ, you will receive the remission of your sins, the gift of the Holy Spirit. You'll be added by the Lord to His church, and, and, and you'll be saved. Say, two commands, repent and be baptized. Three promises, indwelling of the Holy Spirit, forgiveness of every sin, added to the blood-bought church. That's what, that's what the early church was all about. That was the beginning. They were put in jail for doing this preaching. And they said to them, listen, we've tolerated you guys. Acts chapter 4 and verse, uh, 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 verse 19 and 20. But we're going to let you out of jail, but you can't preach anymore. Are you getting this straight? And Peter says, no doubt with a smile, whether it's right to hearken unto God, uh, you more than God, you're going to have to judge. We can't help it. We can't help it. We've got to preach what we have seen and heard. Well, they got out and preached. They put them back in jail. They said, we told you so. We're going to kill you. And the Bible says in Acts 5 and verse 29, we must obey God rather than man. And they put them in jail, but they responded by teaching daily, Acts 5, 41, in the temple and from house to house. And they never stopped sharing the news of the gospel of Christ. I'm telling you, when you let your fingers run through the yellow pages of the book of Acts, you're going to find it's all about souls. It's about numbers of people led to Jesus. So the Bible says in Acts uh, 6 and verse 1, and a great company of the priests were added to the faith. And, and verse 1 says, that, and the number of disciples was multiplied. And verse 7 says, a great company of the priests were added to the faith. And Acts 16 and verse 5 said, so were the churches increased in faith and increased in numbers daily. And then there's that marvelous apostle Paul. Would you like to turn to Romans chapter 9? I'd like to read you just, just flip a few verses is there. In Romans chapter 9, Paul is trying to say to the church, this is what I'm all about. I eat and drink and sleep and think souls. This is what I'm sold out for is to lead people to Christ. And he put it in these words, I'm going to speak the truth in Christ. I'm not lying. My conscience confirms it in the Holy Spirit. I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart, for I could wish that I myself were cut off and cursed from my Christ uh, and for the sake of my brothers, those of my own race, the people of Israel. Turn to chapter 10 and verse 1. And the Bible says, Brethren, my heart's desire. We need to stop and at least emphasize heart's desire. What is your heart's desire? I hope mama buys me a car for graduation. That's not your heart's desire. I hope I get a new deer rifle. I hope we get to go on a cruise. Those are not your heart's desire. What's in the center of you? What is in the core of you? What makes you eat and drink and move? And if it were not there, you would die. And Paul says, My heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel, I want them saved. For I can testify about them that they're zealous for God, but their zeal is not according to knowledge. And then there's that marvelous 1 Corinthians chapter 9, beginning in verse 16, to show you that it was all about souls to the early church. It says in verse 16 of 1 Corinthians 9, When I preach the gospel, I can't boast. Because I'm compelled to preach. Woe to me if I don't preach. If I preach, I'm just distra discharging the trust committed to me. And I'm skipping down because I want to get to verse 19. Uh, Though I'm free and belong to no man, hey, I make myself a slave to everybody to win as many as possible. To the Jews, I became like a Jew to win the Jews. To those under the law, I became like one under the law. Though I myself am not under the law, to win those that are under the law. To those not having the law, I became like one not having the law. Though I'm not free from God's law, but I'm under Christ's law. So as to win. The reason I do everything I do is to win those not having the law. To the weak I became weak to win the weak. I have become all things to all men so that by all possible means I might save some. Now, so Jesus coming to earth was all about souls. The early church was all about souls. Can I tell you it has been 30 years ago that the very first international soul-winning workshop came into being in Tulsa, Oklahoma in March of 1976. Thirty years. We'd been to Florence, Alabama 
to the International Bible College Lectureship. From, Gar from the Garnett Church, the preacher, a couple of elders, and 23 other members went. And, and we all came forward. We all responded. We weren't lost. We weren't even in despi dis despair of what we were doing. But, we were, but what the Bible says about it all being souls really didn't describe the church way we were. We were growing like mad. We were having a lot of fun. We were setting records every Sunday, but it wasn't really about saving lost people. And I remember the next Sunday, the 26 of us paraded through the pulpit. And we said with tears in our eyes and maniacal zeal, this is going, so help me God, this is going to be a soul-winning church. Alan Bryan, many, many years ago, that had a part in the IBC workshops, came to us, to Wayne Monroe of the Memorial Church, and to me and said, through his name, and some of you that know him, remember that's exactly how he sounds. With uh, radical ignorance, in 90 days we put on the first workshop in Tulsa, Oklahoma. 9,000 people came. 5,000 people wrote letters after it was all over. They have come in the next 30 years from 50 states and from dozens of foreign countries. Thousands have got a new start and gotten fired up. Some got fired up and went home and got fired. I'm aware that some of that also happened. From Sunset School of Preaching in uh, Lubbock, Texas, Klein Payton used to say, every year we ask those that are applying, saying, I want to study and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. We ask them the question, what was your motivation for wanting to give your lives to the preaching of the gospel? And hands down, every year it was, I went to the Tulsa International Soul Winning Workshop, and my heart is on fire, and I've got to serve Jesus in full-time ministry. Some of you... <clears throat> <clears throat> Some of you can remember out of this audience. I remember preaching one night on So You Want to Preach. And we made a call out of this audience that those men that wanted to come up here, right up here on this pool, this doesn't belong to the preachers. This is no sanctuary up here. This is, no, this is not the Holy of Holies. This belongs to you. All of this belongs to you, and you need to know. I belong to you. You belong. We all belong to each other. But I mean people came up here, and we prayed for them, and there are men preaching the gospel of Christ today that stood in that pulp, this pulpit that night. There are men that rededicated their lives. One letter I remember said, I was going to quit. And my wife said, don't quit until we go to Tulsa. If you go home from Tulsa and say, I want to quit, then I'll quit with you. And he came forward. He said, I was one of the responses. I went home and told my congregation I'm repenting and getting my life right with God. They all repented. We all came forward, and we all got a fire and new start. That's been the report of the Tulsa International Soul Winning Workshop. It has been the Brotherhood's premier international soul-winning workshop gathering to recenter churches and individuals on Christ's focus. It is so easy for us to get distracted. We didn't have any idea where it was going. Today, we do not know where it is going, except we're looking to Jesus. We're trying to be true to the book. Even if we have not been doing it that way over the years, we want to be true to the book and to the calling of Jesus Christ. We want that fire to live. To, to live. It has simply been the world's largest among churches of Christ family gathering to remind God's people of what church is to be all about. And here we are again at the end of uh, 30 years. Uh, and we're here for the same reminder. We're here to realize that that dirty rat Satan who has no moral scruples, who will do anything, who will use any tactic to get us sidetracked and distracted from the reason Jesus died and the reason for the church being in existence, the reason for the workshop, and the reason for everything that is Christ-like and true to the Bible. Petty issues are easy for us to get, uh, get a part of. And finally, you know, finally we've got to realize that some little bitty things are just that. They are just little bitty things. And in the language of the Apostle Paul from Philippians chapter 1, what does it matter? The important thing is, I really believe that most people come to Tulsa to get focused again on what really matters. They want to do what is really important. They want to be involved with the things that really count. But you see, souls is what it's all about. 
Nothing happens on the earth that is more beautiful and more important than when we lead souls to Christ. You know, I'm involved and with a lot of other people in a great project called Bibles for Africa. And, uh, uh, and, and it's a long story, and I won't tell it, of getting us involved of how I got involved in that. But Roger Dixon, who's my contact in South Africa, and I believe he calls Bibles a little missionary. He says the easiest way to evangelize the world. The simplest way, the most effective way, the cheapest way is to put a copy of the Word of God in the hands uh, of lost people. And, Australia, and, and Africa, by the way, is hungry for the gospel. So we've been a part of uh, uh, Adopt a School, Venda, and, and our singles class at Garnett are doing this thing. Oh, by the way, we're going to have a lunch on Saturday that you're all invited to. Just pay your 6 or $7 over at Garnett and come to that luncheon. I'll be there and other people on how to get a million Bibles into the hands of the African people. But you know I'm doing things in Africa that I'd go to jail for in America. I'm talking in public school pulpits about Jesus Christ and the gospel of Christ and the church of Christ and putting a copy of the Word of God into their hands, which is seed, the Word. The seed is the Word of God, Luke 8 and verse 11. And nothing is more important than that. And, and this time, I know where they say that every Bible we give away is read by at least seven people. So you buy a $2 Bible and it's read by seven people. If one of the seven becomes a Christian and we're successful in getting a million Bibles over there read by seven million people, we would be affecting, we would be affecting one million lives to commit their lives to Jesus Christ. It was this time, Kent, the first time that we ever saw the first visible evidence. Farmers don't often see. You plant and go on, you know, but don't often see. But we were, we were in the Mpapuli school in the Makwarela edition area of Venda, South Africa. And we made a presentation in the Mpapuli school. And, uh, and we gave out Bibles. And they were so happy. And we have pictures. They're holding up the Bible and opening it to see the text. And they're reading and pointing out, you know, and we're doing a campaign that night in the Makwarela section. And an 11, 11, uh, 11th grade girl came out of the Impapuli school. And uh, she listened to me preach. She brought her two younger sisters with her and came forward to be baptized into Christ. It was the first to see with my own eyes of no doubt hundreds and maybe thousands that are already obeying the Lord because Africa is the fastest growing among the restoration movement of churches of Christ and Christian churches in the world. It's happening faster in Africa because we're getting copies of the Word of God there. But it's a marvelous marvelous thing to see. You just give them a copy of the Word of God, and they sit down and read it, and they become children of God. That's what the workshop was all about. That's what the mission of the church is all about. I'm, you know, I'm going to give you, probably give you back a little time. I've got old enough to where when I get through, I quit, and so I'm just going to shout and holler and quit when I get ready, and maybe you'll get a few extra minutes in hand. You'll give them back to me Saturday night. No, I don't know when you'll give them back to me, but anyway, there is a song when it's all been said and done, there is just one thing that matters. Did I do my best to live for truth? Did I live my life for you? <clears throat> I remember the first time I heard that song. I don't know where it was. But I remember hearing that song and turning to my wife and said, I want that song sung at my funeral. Because I want, I want it to be truthfully said about Marvin Phillips. With all the good he did and with all the bad he did. With the great things that God did through him and the many, many mistakes that he made. I want, I want the bottom line to be when it has all been said and done. There's just one thing that matters. It's all about souls. That's the only thing that matters. A few years ago we had a president shot in Dallas, Texas. And I think maybe before the first shot rang out, I think maybe there were several thousand people who might have been entertaining the thought I'd give anything in the world to trade places with him. I wish I could be as powerful, as handsome, as he or that lovely wife sitting beside him. I wish I could be as good-looking, as handsome, as beautiful, as well-known, as rich, as he is, and then a shot rang out from the Texas School Book Depository Building. 
And there was only one thing that mattered. And that thing was how things stood between John F. Kennedy and Jesus Christ. It really is all about souls. A few years ago, Princess Di, who captivated the hearts of many of us, and many women came to love that woman and, and really believe in, in, in out there in the world and working with the poverty and uh, with the poverty stricken and, and with Mother Teresa and all of that. And I, I think maybe a lot of women would wish that they could trade places with Princess Di. Wish I could be as good as her. Wish I could be as pretty as her. Wish I could be as rich and wear the jewels and the, be in the places that Princess Di went. And then the paparazzi were chasing her, and there was a horrible crash. And in an instant, Princess Di was dead. And for all of the money and for all of the fame and for all of the things that might make up her resume, the only thing that mattered was how things stood between Princess Di and Jesus Christ. It's all about souls. Nobody will ever forget the numbers anymore, 9-11. It doesn't mean 9 like... We know it to mean of an emergency number. You say 9-11, people know exactly. Most of us can remember the year, 2001. And uh, a plane, it was announced on the television, a small private plane has just crashed into the World Trade Center. And uh, we thought, oh, this is, this is awful. And we tuned our television sets in just in time to correct that large mistake with the second jumbo jet that crashed into the second tower. And 3,000 people went to a fiery grave. You know, let me, t let me give you, let me focus in on something you may not have thought about. Maybe you have. 19 men, 19 terrorists boarded four airplanes that morning. And their idea was if we can bring down the Twin Towers... And we can crash into, uh, into uh, the Congress building and kill off the leadership of America and White House and maybe even the president. And a fourth plane that probably was headed for the White House and had George Bush's name on their intentions. And the thing were, those 19 guys thought that God, in fact, they were shouting the name of Allah, their name for God. And believing as they went to a fiery grave that what they were doing was of God, and that in the next instant they would all be in this marvelous, marvelous heaven. They didn't call it heaven, but that's where they thought they'd be, praising God. And all of a sudden, on the other side of eternity, there was heard a great noise. Oops! As the people who thought they were pleasing God faced God in Jesus Christ. And the last act of their life was the murder of several million of God's people, including Muslims, believers and unbelievers, women and children. But the only thing that mattered that morning, whether you're one of the 19 or one of the 3,000, were how things stood between you and Jesus Christ. So many things are going to matter in the Day of Judgment. And so many things won't matter. The size of your building, the size of your budget, the flowing words in the tapes of your preacher that goes to hundreds or thousands of people all over the world will not matter. Several things will matter. And they are your efforts at leading other people to Jesus. I'm going to urge you in this, my first of two speeches at this workshop to make yourself three promises. If you know me well, through the years I've always tried to get you to make yourself a promise. Because I know it's too easy to have this thing and get tired and go home and say, boy, that was good, and shake it off, and you ain't worth a flip more than you were before you came. And that's a crime. If you go home the same way. Remember the time they came to see Jesus? And being warned in a dream, they went home another way. It is time from Tulsa that you go home another way, that you go home different. And you will if you will make these three simple promises 
to yourself. Promise number one, I will give my soul totally to Jesus Christ. He will own me. I'll be a Galatians 2.20 Christian. I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. No longer I that lives. Christ lives in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I'm going to live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. Now, you can do that. And I'm going to urge you to do it. Even before you leave this workshop, give yourself through repentance or baptism or whatever scripturally you need to do. Give yourself to Jesus Christ. Number two, be actively involved in what the Bible calls sharing your faith. Now, this is not a competition. You don't have to win as many souls as Mary or John or somebody else. I used to think, I'm not going to be judged by God by not evangelizing the world, but I will be judged by what I did about it myself. So while you're not in competition with some of these really spiritual giants that you will see and hear from these pulpits, and you may never lead to Christ the number of people that some of these wonderful people have led to the Lord, but promise yourself that you're going to heaven and that so help you God you're not going by yourself. All of you know somebody that you'd die for. All of you know somebody you'd give a kidney or a lung or give blood to. And many of you have done exactly that. We have a, a former elder at Garnett that his brother gave him a kidney. That's love, all right. But that isn't near the love that it takes for you to help lead somebody to Jesus Christ. And also, let me urge you to do this for your church. I know you can't change anybody but yourself. But I also know, my brothers and sisters, that what we get up and announce, before God, this is going to happen. <laughs> and I remember those 26 back in 1973 who paraded through the Garnett Church building and said, before God, this is going to be a soul-winning church. Well, we were wild-eyed religious fanatics. But if they kept graphs on the... Garnett Church, there was a sudden spike in interest and people and money and souls led to Christ. Any way you can measure the growth of a church, it happened after 26 people said, so help me God, this is going to be a soul winning church. I'm asking you, you know, the rough old word is, have you got the guts? Have you got the courage? to go home to the congregation you love. And if you don't love them, you can't say this to them. And say to him, so help me God. This is going to be a soul winning church. Make yourself those three promises and don't leave Tulsa without it. Thank you very much.